don't necessarily read off of my PowerPoints, but I do use it as a crutch, and so this is the first time I've, I've talked, maybe forever, uh, without PowerPoint. We used to use slides, of course, uh, instead of PowerPoints, but same thing. So, um, when Christian asked me to talk to you about female empowerment uh, in the veterinary field, one of the things that he said to me, he said, I said, you know, I said, oh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not very philosophical and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure I can do this. And he said, well, think about when you've been, he said, you, 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 he said very tactfully, you've been a veterinarian for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> experienced some discrimination. But I have to admit that probably uh, probably I was very, very fortunate to be a female uh, at a time when it became politically correct to have a token female around. <laughs> and so I think that actually got me in some doors that I might not have gotten into otherwise, to, to tell you the truth. Uh, but what I did try to think about whether I was, could think of any examples of, of discrimination, the only thing I could come up with was when I was being interviewed uh, to get into veterinary school, and, and so you put this into context, this was 1965, um, so some of your parents probably weren't even born yet. <laughs> um, and the fellow who was interviewing me, who was a, a professor on the faculty at Purdue University, he was, he was just sitting there and he was very thoughtful and he said, so, he said, um, you're an only child, right? And I said, yes, the horse is going. <laughs> and he said, and let me guess, your father probably wanted a son, right? And I thought, mm, probably he did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and then he's followed up by saying, so, are you trying to please your father by entering a man's profession? Ooh. Yeah, so, uh, that's the way it was. But we were, you know, I think both the males and the females in my class, we were brainwashed to think that we were very, very lucky to have been admitted. And we, we believed it, and so no matter what happened, we were just happy to be there. So, but I didn't really experience much much discrimination. I'm not naive enough to think that it doesn't exist. I know that it does. Um, my oldest daughter is just going into her fifth year of residency as an orthopedic surgeon in the human field, and. Uh, I think that she experiences more discrimination than probably a hundred times more discrimination than I ever did. I think that orthopedic surgery and human medicine is really um, uh, one of those boys' clubs, uh, and they resent, they seem to resent women. Uh, and I think she's hand, handled it very, very well. So, you know, uh, Christian said, well, just tell people how, how you got where you are and so on and so forth. And I, I guess I would have to say that I have been extremely lucky. Um, so just as Dr. Ritchie said, uh, you know, you, things have to be aligned correctly and, and a lot of it is luck. So I was lucky to have uh, a lot of people mentoring me and helping me from the very, very beginning. So grandparents and parents and professors and peers and residents and graduate students and, and all those people have made me look good. Um, spouses, uh, <laughs> children, so I've been very, very lucky. Um, so after veterinary school, uh, I went into practice in um, a small practice in Greeley, Colorado. And I practiced there for four years, and, and you know, it, um, I wasn't, I didn't love what I was doing. Um, I probably didn't do a very good job of it just because I didn't love it. And, you know, I, I had wanted to be a veterinarian since I was six years old. And so, you know, I was thinking, why am I not loving this? Um, 
So I started going to some continuing education courses, and I went to a psychology course at Colorado State University. It was a two-day course, continuing education course. And I hadn't even, we didn't even do psychology when I was in veterinary school. I graduated in the class of 1970 from Purdue. Um, there were six women in my class. There were six, six tokens. Uh, and it was the, the first veterinary class that had had more than two or three women, I think, maybe any place. So after school, I went to, into this practice and then went to this CE course and just fell in love with this, this topic. I'd been treating a cat uh, that had multiple abscesses on his feet for like two months and it was getting embarrassing, you know, they'd come back and um, maybe it had three abscesses to begin with and now it had six and then it had an abstraining abscess on its, on its face. I cultured it, uh, didn't get anything, uh, was trying different antibiotics, systemic and topical antibiotics and, and nothing. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try some of the psychology stuff and figure out what's, what's going on, what's causing these abscesses. So I made imprints of the exudate from uh, the abscesses on the feet, and I looked at it. I didn't have a very good microscope, but, but that really didn't make any difference. And I didn't recognize anything uh, that I was seeing, and I thought, well, you know, I even thought I really learned a lot, but I don't recognize anything that's on this slide. So the next time I was in Fort Collins, I took the slide with me, and I showed it to Dr. Lawbridge, who had given the, the CE presentation. And he said, well, this is cryptococcus. Your cat has cryptococcosis. That's why it's a fungal infection, and that's why it's not, or a yeast infection, and that's why it's not responding to antibiotics. So I put the cat on the appropriate antifungal drugs, and it got well, uh, which was sort of amazing in itself. And so um, the next time I was talking to him, he said, why, why don't you write this up as a little publication? Because this is a relatively rare disease, and, and it doesn't often respond to therapy, and yours did nicely, so write it up. So I wrote it up for a little feline journal and, and, uh, and got it accepted, and so that was sort of ex exciting, and that sort of got me down this pathway. So that was a very, very lucky event. Um, a residency opened up at Colorado State University in clinical pathology, and I applied for it and was accepted and uh, completed the residency and, and a master's degree, and then a, an opening uh, became available at Colorado State University, and actually the woman, uh, Dr. Maxine Benjamin, who sort of the grandmother of veterinary clinical pathology, um, had been my mentor. And when it came time for me to need a, a job, she actually retired uh, so that that position would be available for me. Unfortunately, they chose a man uh, for that position, but another position opened up six months later, and um, I got that position. And so now, now I was at Colorado State University, and I was teaching and doing diagnostics, and I just loved it uh, compared to practice. So I guess the moral of that story is that you may think that you know what you want to do, but you need to keep, keep um, be, be willing to make change, like Dr. Rajiv said, because you may like something better. So I really enjoyed that. So I had been um, at CSU for probably another four years or so, and uh, we got a new department head. He's a, a wonderful scientist and a wonderful man, but uh, he was, his goal was to make uh, the Department of Pathology at CSU a center of excellence for research, and I didn't have very much research background. And so he very kind called me into his office, as, as he did the other two clinical pathologists, both of whom were very much like me as far as their background. And he said, you know, you do a great job teaching and a great job doing diagnostics, and, and I'm sorry about this, but we're looking for, for researchers to get external grants and to really make CSU um, a really great place for research, one of the best research pathology department in the United States was his goal, and, and they actually got there. Uh, they have more grant money than, than than any other veterinary school or they have for in years past at any rate. 
So basically, he was saying that I was going to get fired, and I had a year to find another job. So the next lucky thing that happened to me is that a cat came in the door with a lysosomal storage disease called mucopolysaccharidosis. And I could spend an hour telling you about this cat, but the short version is that we, we diagnosed what he had. Uh, the, the physician in Denver who diagnosed him by looking at leukocyte enzymes um, said, we're thinking about trying bone marrow transplantation in kids. Uh, and so could you study bone marrow transplantations in cats with this disease? Um, and, and give us some idea of, of how it would work. And I thought, oh my gosh, um, a bone marrow transplant had never been done in a cat before. But um, I had a lot of enthusiastic people, a huge number of people who gave me a huge amount of help. And we actually did a bone marrow transplant in that cat. Uh, we managed to find the, the Tom and the Queen, uh, the mother and the father of that cat, and they produced some kittens for us, and we developed a colony of, of cats with this disease, and we evaluated bone marrow transplantation, which uh, worked pretty well, uh, but there are better things today. But that ended up with me keeping my job. Uh, I didn't get fired. And I also got about 20 years of uh, NIH funding uh, to study that disease and other lysosomal storage diseases. So again, just amazing luck. Um, I was lucky to have, you know, all of these people who were helping me, wonderful colleagues. Um, we had a great time. So a lot of it is luck. But um, it's, not, it's not all luck. And so I think that what you can probably see here is that I took opportunities. Uh, when opportunity knocked, I opened the door. Uh, and so uh, luck has to do with the opportunity coming along. But then you have to do something. You have to open the door and do something about that, that possibility. And so uh, when opportunity knocks, answer the door, I guess would be the, my primary uh, bit of advice to you. Um, my second bit of advice to you would be, is exactly the same that Dr. Rajiv said, do not be afraid of change. Uh, change can be bad, but change can also be very, very good. And if we, if we don't make changes and we close ourselves off to those opportunities for change, we're closing a lot of doors. So uh, if someone offers you a job uh, on an island, uh, <laughs> take it. So I did. And, and fortunately, when I was department head, uh, Dr. Lujiv did as well. <laughs> I hope she thanks and me. And I don't regret it. I hope she I hope she thanks me. I love you guys. <laughs> and this, is, this has been great for me because it's given me an opportunity to teach a huge amount more than, than I taught it at CSU, and it turns out that I enjoy it, so yeah, it's been great for me. Um, another piece of advice that I would give you that has caused me some problems because I didn't take it always is don't take on tasks uh, that you know that you're not going to enjoy doing unless they're a responsibility, uh, unless you have to do it as a responsibility of your position of your job, a uh, requirement for your employment. But if it's not a requirement for your employment, maybe even if it is, sometimes um, just don't be afraid to say no. I think that sometimes we get bogged down in, in doing things and, and that we don't like doing and then we procrastinate and then we, we feel guilty about procrastination and, and it's just sort of a vicious cycle. So we can, we can fix that by, by picking the things that we know that we will enjoy. Um, another piece of advice uh, is uh, don't forget all of the good F words. So there are lots of good F words. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> Fun. Family. Friends. So I guess what I'm saying here is that uh, you can have it all. So I have four children. 
Um, and I think that they are probably my proudest accomplishment. They've all turned out well. That's, that's a lot of luck, too. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, but my oldest uh, son is a very successful sod farmer. He grows turf grass in Indiana. My oldest daughter is a, a human orthopedic surgeon, and, and with any luck at all, she's going to take care of me in <laughs> my old age. Uh, my middle daughter is a science middle school teacher, and my youngest daughter is going into her third year of veterinary school at Colorado State University. So our daughters have that in, in common, and, and they actually are both on the island right now, so we just discovered that, and we'll have to get together this weekend so that they can, because they have met each other. Avoid the bad F words. Um, so the bad F words are, <laughs> <laughs> the worst F word is failure. Uh, and maybe even worse than that is fear of failure. So don't procrastinate, don't put off accomplishing great things because you're, af you're afraid, that because you, you fear that you will fail it. Just dive in and do it, and, and it will be fine. Uh, failed relationships, I've had a few of those. Uh, failed opportunities, uh, and so on. So uh, try to avoid those uh, if you can. So, you know, we're about out of time, so I guess the last thing I would say to you is just find something that you love to do, uh, do whatever you need to do to get it done, uh, take whatever opportunities come your way, and um, I guess it's kind of like Dr. Rajiv said, lean in and, and take those opportunities rather than just saying, mm, well, I'm just, I'm too tired, or uh, I wouldn't know how to do that, or whatever, just have a, an optimistic attitude and, and you'll do great. So I think that's all, all the words of wisdom that I have. So any questions about anything? Okay, well thank you very thank much. Thank you.